Hello, and welcome to Keen Company. I'm Jonathan Silverstein, the Artistic Director, and I am so glad you've joined us for another Keen After Hours. Tonight we have two special guests for you, um, Paul Niebank and Heidi Armbruster. And uh, I think it's gonna be a really fun night and really looking forward to getting started on the conversation. Before we get going, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. I am coming to you tonight from Bangor, Maine, which is the traditional land of the Penobscot peoples. I would like to thank and pay my respect to elders both past and present. If you are joining us, thank you. And if you encounter an indigenous person in your travels this week, I hope you will extend some gratitude. Well, without further ado, let me welcome aboard my perceptive and personable partners in crime, Ashley and Billy. <laughs> wow, it just keeps getting better and better with you, Johnny. Outdoing yourself on the alliteration. <laughs> Come on, man. What can, what can I say? I'm, I'm doing my homework. I love it. I love it. It's like a I Lewis imagine Carroll you with a thesaurus, poem. just like writing notes. Yeah. <laughs> My God. I had to switch away from C's because I really didn't have a lot to offer anymore. <clears throat> right, right, right. Well, it's going to be very sad to uh, to not get that uh, kind of intro because as some of our viewers might know, we are about to uh, hit our, our after hours hiatus after yeah. this episode. Yeah. So this is the the season finale, as it were, mm -hmm. which is very exciting. But I will miss the alliterative intros from you, Johnny. Yes. Uh, uh, can you just go ahead and email us them like every Monday? Please, Maybe I can. Me at the team meeting. Yeah. I can. Thank yeah. you. We'll, we'll, we'll do that at the staff meeting, and it will okay. only just be for you two. Right. <laughs> okay, or, great, the rest of yeah. Them, you're really confused. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You can just go live <laughs> at six thirty every yeah. Monday night, Johnny. And just say, you know, <laughs> Ashley and Billy are great. And then leave. <laughs> Speaking of the rest of our team and team meetings, we are going on a brief Keen After Hours hiatus. But mm -hmm. um, on May 17th, we will be back for one final very special episode of Keen After Hours, which with the whole team, with um, sort of a roundup of the season and a bunch of stuff to celebrate. So mm -hmm. If you're really sad about missing Keen After Hours, we will miss you the next couple weeks. But remember, you can always watch back episodes on our website or on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, and then we'll be back May 17th for a grand season special. Mm -hmm. It's going to be Is like Johnny gonna... Carson's last show. It's, it's going to be, gonna like be exactly like that. <laughs> Bette Midler's going to sing Wind Beneath My Wings. Mm -hmm. It'll be huge. That's pretty classy because I was going to say it's sort of like a reunion episode of The Real Housewives. <laughs> <laughs> that too. That too. Are you Andy Cohen or will we be getting Andy Cohen, Johnny? Uh, no, I can't be Andy Cohen. I won't be Andy Cohen, but I might be Bethany Frankel. Great. Oh, great. I've always thought that about you. I'm going to be that cat in the meme. I don't watch the show. <laughs> cat in the meme. <laughs> oh, man. That We're is already great. off the rails. We haven't brought it in our favorite No, guest. I love it. I think I, I don't watch the show, but I assume I'm Countess Luann merely because of my 54 Below credits. Yes. If I had to guess. Yes. yes. I mean, come on. Perfect. Speaking of 54 Below, before we welcome on our guests, I kind of can't contain the news that happened at the end of last week which is our very own Billy Reese is putting out an album at the end of this week. And it was covered by page six. Yeah. It was by covered everyone. by, it was covered by variety. I think even theater pizzazz covered. It. I think. Yeah. 
I think Nightlife Exchange. I, I yes, DC Metro Arts. Um, yes, no, it is called Little Black Book. It is a concept album um, loosely based on the life and times of Heidi Fleiss, uh, featuring 11 incredible Broadway leading ladies, Alice Ripley, Lilius White, uh, or Faye, Mandy Gonzalez, Diana DeGarmo. I'm so excited. Uh, and you can stream it everywhere on, on April 9th. So thanks for the shout out, Johnny. Truly, that's what we'll all be doing on Friday. So go ahead and follow Billy Reese on all of the socials so you can you can join us for the party on Friday. Yes, yes, thank you. And that's thank partly you. why we'll be on hiatus for so long because Billy is gonna be busy. <laughs> I assume touring Vegas or something. I mean, yes. we'll yeah. see, we'll see. Touring Heidi Fleiss's Parrot Ranch in Nevada. Yeah, right. exactly, exactly. Well, <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, Ashley. No, I was just going to say, speaking of from one Heidi to another Heidi, yes. we have two very special Ex guests. Exactly. I think we should bring them out. I am so excited. Uh, we wanted to bring them to today's episode uh, because they share the distinction of the most keen company productions yeah. with four shows, I believe, right? Yes. So, yeah. They've both, yes, they've both done three main yeah. stage shows and they've yep. both done a very special benefit, so. Yes, yes, exactly. So I am so excited to bring them out. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paul Nevank and Heidi Armbruster. That was <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, let me just give a brief introduction to you, th you two amazing people. Um, you know, we very rarely have two people on After Hours, but you two are share an amazing distinction of anyone we've had on After Hours and indeed anyone in the Keene family. Um, both Heidi and Paul have both been in three main stage shows at Keen Company, as well as numerous benefits and readings and special benefit broadcasts. Um, and uh, they are, you know, not only such um, esteemed Keen alums, but they also also share the heart of Keen Company. So uh, first off, we have Heidi Armbruster. Heidi has appeared in Good Morning Bill in 2003, Tea and Sympathy in 2007, and Boy in 2016, among other things. Um, uh, I have only directed Heidi in one of those pieces, but it was kind of a landmark piece which was Tea and Sympathy. It was the second piece I ever directed for Keen, and oh my God, it was such a special, special play yeah. and experience. Yeah. Yeah. I just, and, yeah. <laughs> and you were a genius. I'm, I'm not sure I can go a genius. Am I supposed to talk now? Do I do talking now? <laughs> if you'd like to, you can talk. That was a allow it. Play. That was like, like, that was the kind of play where you're like, oh yeah, I had one of those. So now I can, you know, do other things. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like the kind of show that you look back in your career and like if everything else is taken away from me, I got to do that play at that time with those people. You're such a good director. That was really a delight. And what a great company you made. And um, there was an incredible amount of heart in that script, but in that production, in that company. That was really charming. It really was. It really was a joy, and that is when I first met Kathy Kafer, oh, who God. replaced Randy Danson. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Oh, look at this. We have a, a note have from Alan Zucker. Zucker. Good morning, Bill. Was my first Keen show at the Connolly. Those were the days. That is so. Wow. Next, Boy. next up, we have Mr. Paul Niebank. Mr. Niebank has appeared in Such Things Only Happen in Books. That was in 2009 to celebrate Keen Company's 10th anniversary. Um, Walk in the Woods in 2014 and Boy with Heidi Armbruster in 2016. 
So I am happy to report that I have directed you in two out of those three shows, which is kind of crazy. Wow, that's totally crazy. Now that I think of it, yes. Or I have well, directed I you and such back. things only happen in books. Yes. Mm. But Paul, um, Paul yes. has been like a a a friendly, heart-filled presence in Keen Company ever since 2009. He has come into many of our benefits. He has even brought his beautiful daughter <laughs> as part of our benefits. Yes. And he is a light and a fantastic human and actor. So welcome, Paul. Thank you very much. It's so nice to be here. It's lovely to see all your kind faces. I know. We miss having, uh, usually yes, we have uh, both I, of you in our office. We miss all you. All the time. And, I, and Grace is now four. I think the last time I came to your office, she was one and a half, two, maybe. Tiny, so, tiny. Yeah. It's been a while. Oh my wow. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. She's 30 pounds now and speaks volumes. And yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's your, that's, that's probably your, your, your most impressive production that you've had. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, this is her artwork behind me. Um, and uh, she is, uh, th it is for sale. <laughs> um, I don't know why. Great. <laughs> yeah, uh, she's she's quite my all my attention is there now because she is I will say during the pandemic time we all haven't been able to work the way we would love to but yeah. it has been amazing to have that gift of time with her um, and that was a surprise and a, a blessing yeah well I hear you're doing eight shows a week as whatever villain she wants you to play in whatever story she hasn't concocted <laughs> It's funny when you finally finally learn to start to say no to your little girl that says, uh, could you play Scar again or Han again? Um, and uh, you finally say, uh, I you know, it's 7.30 in the morning. I can't be Scar. <laughs> I just, maybe you warm up at at night, maybe later in the afternoon. But 7.30 in the morning, I just have to have a cup of coffee first. And then, <laughs> or sometimes 5.30 in the morning. Let's play mm -hmm. Frozen again. And it's like, oh, I love you. I just can't do it anymore. <laughs> she is branching out. I was saying earlier that she is branching into Star Wars now. So I have done some voices. Um, I'm not very good at Yoda. Jess is better at Yoda. Um, and she's, she is uh, taking up Star Wars so that she can speak with her other four-year-old classmates who are... Uh, that's where all their focus is. And she said, oh, I have to read this book so that then I can converse with them in class. It's, it's, I, I know she did that on purpose. Yeah, so she's into little synopses of all the movies. And she loves Leia, of course, and is getting onto Ray and um, loves Chewbacca. And yeah, so we're branching out. So that's good. So I don't have good. to play villains all the time. <laughs> Yeah. Good because you usually play nice guys, mm -hmm. <laughs> except maybe in Boy. That was kind uh, of a question, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because that production. You know, we've talked about how the play was actually he. The character was less of a uh, scary dude um, than in real life. So it was interesting to have it softened, though. Yes, he was still a questionable uh, doctor. Mm -hmm. Was that the first um, play that you and Heidi have done together? Isn't that? It's funny. It seems you ask like that. Heidi. I'm, I'm, yeah, go ahead. Wait, no, I don't. Because I'm, I'm thinking like there would be overlap at Mint, overlap at Keen. But then I have this idea of having worked with you, but maybe it's just in my readings. That yeah, it's something I always I'd always wanted to do, and I knew we I I always seen you in so many things, and then I can't remember if we like did a reading or something before that yeah. because I felt like I knew you before we actually did the show at Keen. Totally. We well, we're on the Keen so Bowling team for a while. 
together. So. Oh. <laughs> yes, you were there. Speaking of after hours, oh my God. That thing doesn't start till 11 p.m. Bowling. I know that. We were okay. awesome. We were Couldn't all, make yeah. you two or three with us. But I still have my, uh, my wrist card. You know, I've got to keep that wrist straight. There weren't so any jackets really or any sort of memorabilia? There were t shirts. T shirts. Good looking t shirts, too. Okay. All right. I'll yeah. take it. <laughs> Maybe post quarantine will revive it. In my stack, it's, got, it's little, got little white cuffs. And yeah. there was a keen, uh, keen, not keen bowl. What, what did it say? I can't remember at all, but it was, it was something, something clever. clever. Yeah, it was very clever. Um, but yeah, we did that for one season. You all didn't go back and do that again, did you? Bowling. No, 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 no. We, 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 we were, we were too busy um, having laughs and doing work in the office until like seven, eight, nine, ten o'clock. <laughs> Just extending it over at the Broadway bowling league. <laughs> Actually, we could have. That's well, a good point. That is a very good point. It doesn't start till 11 p.m., so you could easily come after office hours. And All right, and drag Ashley. Into the office the 2022, morning. we're starting it. Ashley, Billy, I'm ready. Bowling. Done. Keen Cohorts Bowl, 20. sold. I love bowling. That's the one sport I there can do. Come on. That's oh. the thing about it. I don't want to play softball. Right, no, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> not. Ball. Right, and, and it is the least amount of effort in terms of sports, I mean, you get to sit for, you know, five minutes at a time. You get and snacks? Then, right. Come on. The oh. ratio of athleticism to drinking is right. really in. <laughs> exactly where you want it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I had to take PE in college, and one of one of the two classes, one of the two PE classes I had to take was bowling. <laughs> wow! I took it in high school. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did too at Boston University. And you would yes. walk to the bowling alley. Keen pins. Keen pins. Keen pin pins. Well done, whoever. Shout out to whoever invented that years ago. Well done. We're bringing it back. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Carl. Shout out to Carl Porson. So we like to take a little bit of a trip down memory lane here at Keen After Hours. And um, we I'd like to ask you both, we're gonna start with Heidi. Um, we're gonna put you on the hot seat first. And um, can you tell us uh, a little bit about when you started getting involved in theater and or when you sort of like got bit by the bug and you know you knew that this was something like oh I'd be into doing this oh that's a crazy story because I still I'm still like should I go to law school <laughs> <laughs> right really <laughs> the fact that I am, in fact, an actor. I think because I grew up in Wisconsin on a dairy farm, do you know, and I didn't know any actors. Like I'd never met a person who made their life as an artist, made their living as an artist. And so you sort of grow up with that idea of like, oh, you're going to be a movie star, you're going to be a starving artist, but there's nothing really in between. Mm -hmm. And um, so I did plays in high school, but I didn't really know that that was a thing you could be when you grew up. And so I went to college on a butter scholarship. I got $10,000 from Land Lakes Butter, and I was an agricultural economics major. At How do you earn a butter scholarship, out of curiosity? Just get really good grades. And okay, great. Right. You didn't have to do some kind of butter sculpture or something. No, but oh, that I had. But I was Wisconsin's junior, is that what it was? Wisconsin's dairy, anyway, whatever. And um, I was a, you know. Wow! Whoa! We Did you ride on like pictures. a butter? Did you ride on a butter float? I mean, it wasn't made of butter. But <laughs> basically, yes. And um, because my dad was the cow guy. Because my um, dad worked at the University of Wisconsin Madison. He was the cow guy. He was like the the dairy farm guy. And so he knew that all of this scholarship money went on the plane. So I like applied and I got the scholarship. I went to college and then I was sitting in these econ lectures and these chemistry classes. I mean, it really was chemistry. 
No, but it was chemistry. I never talk about, I never tell this story this much in depth and I promise I will wrap it up. No, we love it. Chemistry teacher who was like a Shakespeare scholar and a chemistry dude. And he would get up and I realized I kind of loved chemistry, but what I was actually loving was his performance. Mm. And um, so very quickly after that, I started doing plays in college. And then I had this wonderful professor in college who was like, you know, this is a thing you can do, but you should go on to train. And so I ended up going to um, American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco right out of undergrad. And then I came after getting my MFA there, I went to New York City. But even I was still like studying for my LSAT in like the <laughs> second year of graduate school. So it really took a lot. And you know who it is? And I don't, I think I tell her this like once every few years when I run into her, but Kathleen McNenny mm. was the first like New York City actress that I met. And I was like, oh, this is a thing. You can be when you grow up. Like she, yeah. had, she had a daughter, she had a wife, she did play. You know, and then you come to the like Kathleen McNenny is one of this very, you know, fortunate few who made her living in like sort of the commercial sphere and, you know, her husband has six Tony Awards. And so it was, I was really meeting like New York theater royalty, but at the time yeah. it was so normal. <laughs> right. I could be that. Yeah. So, yeah. So then I became that and I, I guess I'm, I'm still that. Have Come you to- ever played any um, chemistry teachers in homage to the performance you imagined yourself giving? No, I've played no chemistry teachers. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I really have played very few lawyers. Oh, that's actually very surprising. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very few lawyers, mm. um, but lots of moms, all moms that, you know, mostly crying moms. But now the older I get, I get to do, you know, like criminal moms and fun mm. moms and bad moms and goofy moms and, mm-hmm. you know, moms, murderous moms. And that's, that's fun. But lots, I've kind of made my living playing moms. Have you done any dairy farm moms? Really gone all the way to your roots? Definitely. Oh, really? Yeah. Dairy farmers, lesbians, and moms. (laughs) Those are the the niches. Yeah. Have you ever done all three at once? No, that would be awesome. And if she could also be a lawyer, Mm -hmm. that would be like, and I've also felt too, like the one thing I would like to do in my career that I haven't gotten to do is like, be in a Western and ride a horse. I feel like if I got to ride a horse in a Western, my father's, <laughs> that would really be like, yeah, dream would come true. And I would feel like, you know, I had really, I had really made him proud. Well, we're still looking for, you know, season 2022 at King Company. Yeah. So we Maybe can work on a Western. Something with a horse. Yeah. I can see a horse. A horse can totally like hang out backstage at Theater Row. I can see that. They might have so to be Paul- a two-hander. Yeah, yeah. There are only two dressing rooms, so it'll be the horse and you. I'm into it. I'll share. I'll share with the horse. I'm like Great. all about animal husbandry. Uh, agricultural income manager. I'll mm. make sure that horse for you. I'll make sure it's got the right investment portfolio. <laughs> it could be a play about like Catherine the Great or something. Come yeah. on. Yeah. Great. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, Paul, what about what about you? Bring us, bring us back, bring us back to the early days of Paul Niebank as an actor or theater person. I um, <laughs> I was in Santa Cruz, and I was occasionally in a. Oh, no. oh, we lost him. That story to pause, though. It I really know. was wow. in Santa Cruz. Be right back after this commercial break. <laughs> oh, God. In Santa Cruz. Wait, no. Do you know the way to Santa, Santa Cruz? Cruz? We'll make it work. <laughs> yeah. We'll make it work. How come there's so many songs about Santa Fe? Like, what's all, what's that all about? Especially in musicals. There's two, yeah. and that's a lot. Yeah. That's yeah. not, aren't there three? Yeah. What's the third? Rent, Rent Newsies. Oh. oh, oh, Santa Cruz. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. You were in Santa Cruz. That's what we got. <laughs> okay, so I was never. I was playing water polo. I can't, am I on now? Yes. You got me. Okay. Um, 
You were so, playing water polo? I was playing water polo. I was, you know, hanging out by the beach and beginning a junior lifeguard. And But one, we, we spent the freshman year in San Francisco because my folks, we just lived there for a year. Um, and my sister was going to take classes at ACT. Oh. Speaking of ACT, Heidi. <gasps> and I was like, uh, can I go? And they sort of looked at me like, uh okay yeah sure and i remember really enjoying it but it wasn't really my thing except i went to an airlock and arts academy music camp oh wow because i was in choirs i was in all state choir and california central coast choir and and so i went for the national music camp and they said come back we'll give you a scholarship come back for your senior year in high school as an acting major and i was like what and but i went and then so i did my first straight play which was tally's folly mm. and it's a two-person play for those of you who don't know mm -hmm. and it's very lovely and it's it talks about the fr fragility of the human uh we humans as eggs afraid to bump up against each other and it's and one of my fellow um students said oh you're a real actor because we were all musical theater actors. We were just gonna do that. And they said, oh, you really, I think that kid planted the seed of me being an actor. Wow. Yeah, all those years ago. And now, um, cut to, went to Boston University right out of undergrad, but then was a chauffeur for Steve Rubell and Ian Schrager in New York City oh back in a uh, certain year, um, 1987. And uh, I was, those are the guys who started Studio 54. And I was their night driver, driving Barry Diller, Diller, Calvin Klein, Bianca Jagger. I was a very naive 21 year old. And they were doing rolled up you know, co cocaine with rolled up hundreds in the back seat. It was totally classic. And I learned a lot, left New York after a year and didn't come back for 10 years. Wow. After grad school, I did, did it, first I did Construction in California, Katie Waiter, a doorman in Seattle, fishing boat in Alaska, travel around the world a bit, and then finally got into grad school at age 30, and then came here after right after grad. So that was it was a long journey. I knew I had a lot of soul opening growth that I needed to do before I could really commit to being an actor. So that's what, that's in short, that's what my story is. I knew none of that, and I'm I'm shocked by every part of it. Yeah. It's, uh, I knew pieces of it, but I did not know the water polo part. <laughs> that was really, it's really stuck in your head. <laughs> it's been a good, it's been, I've been, you know, anywhere from water polo to riding on camels in Rajasthan to uh, elephants in, uh, in Thailand to um, Quaker conference in Kenya, um, deepening of soul and finally saying, okay, now I'll come, come mm. be this actor and do this life. Yeah. I can't get over Steve Rebell. That yeah. is a name I did not expect to hear. Yeah. My God. Yeah. It was a crazy scene. And I was, you know, I hadn't lived it. I was in New York for two weeks. And back then, you looked in the newspaper for ads to answer ads for jobs. And they had an opening at the, they owned the Palladium Club at that point. And I went down and, and for a security guy, Ad, and he said, oh, you had to be 6'2 or over, and I was 6'1. So, and he said, oh, you seem smart. You want to be Steve's driver? And I was like, uh, yes, yeah, sure. And I went up to Steve's office, and he was on the phone, as usual, and he quoted one date, and I saw that uh, he was in the calendar. He was looking at the wrong thing. So I, I motioned to his secretary, and boom, I got the job. After being in New York for two weeks, I was their chauffeur. Wow. Um, and wow. it was and it was crazy, and it was. Uh, I would get you know I'd get on in the afternoon at two thirty and go to bed, you know usually around four thirty in the morning back in Brooklyn, um, and it was yeah it was a crazy scene uh, to be made aware of and be like oh yeah you're you're pretty naive, why don't you go learn some things before you come back? Here? <laughs> and I'm still yeah. just as naive, and I'm realizing that now with my four year old. I'm just as naive as I always have been. <laughs> wow. I really, I think we need pictures of you 
as the driver, and then I want to pair that with Heidi's picture being the butter queen. Yes. Ah, yes, yes. We need to prepare like this is your lifestyle episode where we yeah. just bring back, we bring back the guy that told you you were a real actor in that class. Oh, God. Oh, I wish he had never said it. I should have been a, I was, my other job since I was in Santa Cruz, I was going to be a forester. I had a cousin who was mm. high up in the parks departments and I should have been a tree hugger. That's really where I would have been happy. But that, <laughs> that's the way it goes. Well, I don't know. I, I never would have met you, so I, I would be sad. Oh, well, see, mm -hmm. I would be sad too. Same. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we would never have gotten to do Walk in the Woods. Mm. Yes. Again. Yeah. Yeah. Which was an incredibly special, special yeah. show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For those of you listening in at home, that was season. Boy, 15, I think, maybe yeah. 16, 15. Yeah. And Paul and Kathleen Chalfant were in uh, Lee Blessings, A Walk in the Woods. Um, and uh, it was just a, wow, it was just a beautiful experience. Yeah, Such a was. moving, moving play in a play that you wouldn't necessarily think so as moving, uh, mm -hmm. talking about two arms negotiators. Yeah. I think it really epitom epitomized um, Keane's heart uh to do something that was so intimate and to have the whole experience be one that was just a a lovely gentle searching with big ideas and scope um emotionally uh and so that it was a joy to do all the way through kathleen would usually talk about politics because she is so on the nose with all her politics and she would naturally go, and then suddenly we would start to yeah. do the scenes. And and then we would just flow into the scenes, and then Johnny would just hone what needed to happen. And it what didn't feel like we had to dive into rehearsal. It just sort of naturally worked our way. We worked our way into it. That was a gift. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was a gift. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We, we've been working on our keen ethos. And one of the things that we talk about is um, good process makes good art. And that's a perfect example of, of that. Like you yeah. could feel the spirit of that rehearsal room on the stage. Yeah. Um, Shout out from Rock in the, Walk in the Woods. I, I got to see it on Broadway with Sam Watterson and Robert Prosky. Well, this is a very different cast and I'm so, I'm so glad. <laughs> I did, I did. I did hear some very nice, nice comparisons to that Broadway production from our production. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So, um, let me ask you guys. You have done so much work in in you know everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now let's put the keen work aside because obviously that's the top of anything you could do. Um, your height. Um, yeah. Are there any? Um, you know, are there any experiences, whether it be the play itself or or, or um, the role or the process that have stood out to you? It doesn't necessarily have to be in New York. Um, and I know that's a big, big question. So we're going to play some music to give you some time to think. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's so funny because you were talking about history. I'll, Heidi, Heidi, I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, we're talking about history and we're talking about interlocking and it's so funny what stays with you and it's always the early shows and, mm -hmm. and you, you asked Heidi when I faded out I think was um, what uh, roles you would like to be cast in and I got to play the judge in Sweeney Todd my senior year in high school at interlocking and I would love to do that again mm. because mm. the ensemble of um, that of actors who did that at that moment, we were kids, but yeah. we all dove in and created this thing out of nothing. And it was, it's those kinds of experiences that stick with you. And you, I, I am always looking, looking for some sort of repeat of that. That mm -hmm. is, it's not about the bigness of the show or the scope of the show or the event. Um, it's the, the truth of, of, who's in the room and what we're trying to create. And I think, so I've always wanted to do the judge again because of that, that experience. And um, 
maybe I'm, when I'm even older, I will get to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that there's been a lot of gray hair. Once you have a kid, it comes yeah. out very fast. <laughs> It was not there uh, about three years ago. Um, or or run a theater company. Or, run a <laughs> <laughs> or anyway. just global pandemic. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> so Heidi, I throw the question back at you so that, uh, oh, you gosh. Know. Yeah. Well, there's like, like, I loved doing that play at Rattlestick, that um, Sam Hunter play that. Mm. Uh, um, directed that three hander, and then we did it paired with another play, and it was teeny tiny. And the thing I think I also really liked about that play is I had played that role earlier. It was right before Boy, remember? Mm. Oh, um, right. In Dallas, and there was something about the way that that part like baked inside me over those three years. Like, um, there was something about that woman, despite the fact that she was very different from me who sort of like took hold. I was thinking about this the other day. I did this production of, of um, uh, Glass Menagerie at the end of ACT. It was in my third year uh, with Robin Mosley. Robin Mosley played Amanda. Um, and that I had, you know, I was still in school and I had gotten separated from my classmates. They were doing another thing, but I was doing this. Thing. So I didn't have class for like a period of time. And I walked around those hills of San Francisco with this like weight on my leg, trying to imagine what it would be like to be, you know, I mean, it sounds terrible to say right now because you wouldn't cast an able-bodied actor in the, the role of a disabled woman, but trying to find that um, body in my body and, and still, to this day, if I'm on stage and I start to feel like I want to hide, my left foot will pivot in. Like it's weird. Like my I let myself go so far into that character, and I and the same with that play like too. Like it kind of just baked in me in a way I, I feel proud of, I guess. Yeah. No, and then you end up in your therapist's office, like weirdly <laughs> pieces of yourself, and you're like, oh, this is why. Um, you know, but but then there have been other things too. Like like I did this production of Blythe Spirit at the Gothic that was just like I've never sweat so much, like I've never done anything so athletic, playing Bruce and making like crazy costume changes and just like I mean it's just like a verbal wall. I mean, it's just, she's just, you know, uses her words as weapons and like, no coward. And you're like, oh, that just feels like, you know, <laughs> so that's fun too. And then, and then you get into a whole thing where you're like, oh, the stuff I've written, or whatever, that's going to be cool to like be. It. So there's like, mostly I feel like these days when I get to do a play, it went through a period of time where it felt like work. And lately, or like the idea of it is so like vacation. I, doesn't it sound nice to do a play? God, it, even having this conversation. Okay, now I'm totally off topic. But like, God, I miss doing plays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. I miss being in that room. Yeah. That's a thing, Paul, that you, that, I mean, because that's totally why I wanted to be an actor, because those high school rehearsals, those college rehearsals, where it was like you were all in, and then you stayed yeah. Late to build the set and then everybody was doing like six different things and you were just collaborating and everybody was doing all of the heavy lifting you know you were just all in and it was the only thing in the world I could do where I would forget to eat like I loved it so much I would forget that I wanted to go have pizza or whatever so the only thing in my life where I forget about pizza <laughs> <laughs> that's a tall order yeah I mean, yeah, just that feeling of collaboration, and I miss that. that room. Sorry, I'll be quiet. I got to do I got to do one of those uh, years ago. They, every year, or I don't know how often it happens. I think it's every three years. There's a European cultural festival, and the different cities are chosen. And one year it was Linz, Austria, and another city. The Goodman Theater was creating with a European director this um, Joan Dark based on the Schiller text. It's the only one where Joan of Arc gets, um, doesn't die. Um, and she, uh, so she, she, so we got to explore it in the room 
at the Goodman for two months, like to find it, literally find the text. Because we started with Schiller, but then we just took it all apart, brought in music. We, I spent more time naked, muddy, and bloody. And <laughs> the, the floor would just be covered with water. And, um, and then we took it to Linz, and it ultimately be, became image, 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 and stuff didn't flow into a full piece. And the Goodman said, thank you. We're not going to buy you um, the contract back. And so we'll buy you out. And it's, we're not going to put it on back at the Goodman, which is a major bummer. But everybody in Austria loved it. And after, But it was two and a half hours without intermission. And it was, uh, but it, it was full dive into this thing that we created. Uh, and it felt like such a gift because we're not allowed that time in the States mm. um, normally. Um, and we're not allowed that kind of deep exploration. And that was another one along the path. You know, for, for perspective, for those listening at home, we our typical rehearsal process is maybe three weeks in a room and one week of tech preview yeah. sort of time. So two months in the room is amazing. In the room, that was it, yeah, yeah. Before we even went and tried to make a show out of it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And how amazing as well, Heidi, to do a role, a, a full process production, and then let it bake for a while and then come back to do it again. Yeah. You know, a whole process and production again. How beautiful. Yeah, that was really, that was lucky. Yeah. I think that's a. I think that's one of the things that's a little sad about the American theater is that we we um, we're too fast. Yeah. Like get up, do it, figure it out, so that we can put it in front of an audience. But yeah, such are the economics. <clears throat> we we all we all got into it to explore what we what we're going through as in the human condition. And I know I was just having a discussion with somebody the other day about I, I chose to be an actor so that I could step in that person's shoes over there, mm -hmm. that I could mm -hmm. understand what he or she was going through and he or she or him or her. Um, and uh, and now we have, now it is it's so fast that we have to, there's no time to sort of rest into that and doing like you, we got to do Heidi, repeat shows so that you can really own it. And uh, it changes your soul. Uh, it's such a gift, but it's it's rare. Yeah. Mm. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I think when I grew up being a director, uh, when I first started directing, I was really into Andre Gregory, and yeah. who did Vanya on Forty Second Street, yeah. and uh, I, that whole idea of like working on something with the same collaborators for several years, years, like seemed to me to be the ultimate thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Look, it's so, it's, you call it the elephant in the room. It is that like economic thing, or even like, you know, we did the show regionally and then bringing it back into New York, how lucky I am that they came to me eventually. They do the part. I know I wasn't their first choice. <laughs> like, like that you get to it, economic, or even now, how, you know, we sit in these, I don't want to be political, but we sit in these, this time of deep uncertainty and, and lack of the kind of storytelling that we're all, is our lifeblood quite literally and metaphorically. Like it's, um, it's too bad that the American theater is so dependent on the economic, it's too bad that the story of the American theater is so often one of economic disparity, of, of yeah. lack. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. That makes me think a lot because <laughs> as a producer, all one wants to do is create the best art possible with the resources you have. And, and it is a, it, it is a, um, uh, there's a lot of scarcity and competition for resources and it's too bad that, 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 um, is kind of the way it's baked into the system. Yeah. It's interesting to have this year. I mean, that's my question for all of you guys. But okay, I don't know if people are actually, but I kind of want to know like what you all have been doing with your year. 
because there was this crazy thing of like, all of a sudden, like I couldn't work even if I wanted to. So then it became like, okay, well, what do I want to do? And I was really sort of shocked at the answer to that question. Like there was something about when you take economic necessity out of the equation, just because mm -hmm. you can't plug into it. Like what, where does your soul gravitate towards? It was interesting to sort of find where my curiosity led, but I feel like that's the question. And as we're starting to think about things are feeling like they're loosening up and we're heading into something that I mean, I hesitate to say normal, but I'm double back. Like I'm vaccinated. So like there is a sort of freedom that's coming back and just the awareness and like, how is what we've learned from this year going to influence where we go? And I'm, I think the question that I have most is like, what have people learned about that i don't even know if i what is, well what what is to answer you what did you what did you find heidi what do you what did your focus go okay not to bring this back to you, i like farming turns out right. i am a farmer after all <laughs> <laughs> we can't believe we came full circle full circle <laughs> beginning middle end wow I, that's great yeah it's fun to grow things and have animals Mm -hmm. What kind of what animals do you have? Well, cats mm -hmm. and cows and um, chickens, but you know, and um, and but vegetables and flowers. Lovely. This year has definitely been a year of pivoting, I think, for everyone. Yeah. But listening to both your stories, it reminds me that like the life of an artist is all pivoting. <laughs> it's yeah. always like, oh, you did. I, we did ten thousand things, and then and then we learned to do ten thousand more things, and that's sort of part of the game. So I think in some ways we're lucky to be working in the theater where pivoting was maybe less scary than some industries. I think yes. we're being creative and scrappy. And hopeful is kind of our our whole deal, which is which is I'm grateful for this year. Right on. Yeah, we we I feel very grateful that as a theater company we are small and scrappy and we're able to pivot. Um, steering the ship in a different direction when when you're a smaller company is very different than when you're a large several million dollar company. Um, it's harder to turn that cruise ship than it is our sleek sailing boats. Can we see <laughs> river cruise? Keen, keen cruises? Real <laughs> uh, I'm in it. I'm in it. I'm in Are it. You in the but it is, that's a, it's a great question, Heidi. I mean, uh, and, you know, I certainly have been thinking like, gosh, what is, I've been thinking a lot about what does Keen want to do when we're actually yeah. able to produce again. And it's a really, it's a question that sort of, is a constant one. Mm. Um, and uh, I think it's very interesting that the question of how does one build back better uh, yeah. than one was before. Um, and, uh, you know, we can only hope that that sort of everyone in the industry sort of, we rise to a, a, a new, a, a new better place, I hope. Yeah. You all have already had already begun to lead that change, all the changes that we're having going on. Um, in terms of BIPOC focus and uh, trying to expand what your range was very quickly, even before this began. And I'm, I'm so excited to see where you go next. That, of course, shows that include Heidi and I, because <laughs> we have to keep our numbers up. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but now we're also I've, I've, I've always been impressed with your ability, the three of you, to just shift and go. It's amazing to me. Oh well, thank you. That means that means a lot, and it's been a really, um, it's been a. We've learned so much in the process, and that was even before everything that we've learned anew this year. Um, it's uh, it, it's been a um, it's been a time of growth and change. Yeah. Yeah. As I was saying earlier, you know, it's funny because I had the gift of grace, my daughter Grace, literally and figuratively, she gave me a gift of other focus and mm. to be able to uh, become a deeper uh, and also, also, also more joyful in the moment 
which mm. is kind of what our work is about anyway, all of us in this <laughs> business, mm -hmm. um, to try to just shift in the moment and be present in the moment. That's all I do. That's the day. And so to have her hand me that in this fallow time where we're supposed to also fill ourselves back up um, and, and hide it in, in new ways um, so that we will come back in a with different perspective and different energy and different um, uh, different willingness. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, we are at that time of the show where we break out the keen question bowl oh, with our last 10 minutes. Okay. Good what? because I can't I good because I can't tear up anymore tonight. Yeah, Dunny's already Dunny, need to give him a break. A gift, of, the gift of grace. I mean, for <laughs> hate to kill the mood, but what kind of questions are in the bowl? Like, have you ever I mean, like how salacious are these questions? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you'll see. No, okay. okay, getting to know They're you. They're pretty okay. innocuous, but a couple of them are tricky. Oh, right. I hope Paul gets a tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> it's all you. Okay, we're starting really basic. Are you coffee or tea, people? Coffee. coffee. Wow, you both are okay. coffee. Yeah. Okay, whatever production number four is for both of you, because we have to keep the street going so that you guys are always tied. <laughs> Well, it's now we have a problem too, because now it's like, unless you just keep casting us as like a package deal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like. It's true. It's going to be a constant competition. <laughs> we already talked about this a little bit, but would you have any alternate professions? Farmer sounds like yours, Heidi. Yeah, I would make wine. I think that's, I think that would combine like the farming part, the gardening part. And the chemistry part, you know, yeah. and the you know the eating and the drinking part. Yeah. I think, I think mm. I, I've been thinking about that recently. How much fun it must be to give like vineyard tours. I was like, that's probably cool. That's theater. That is theater. Yeah, yeah. environmental theater. And you can just enjoy it more and more as you go to say, hey, yeah. check this one out. Salud. Right. Another sip. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, we did talk about me um, hugging trees, and I, yeah. I would have been a, a forest ranger, but I also could have just been a beach bum in Santa Cruz, and I could have just never have left. A water polo, a water polo beach polo. bum. Lifeguard too, lifeguard, yeah. <laughs> lifeguard water polo beach bum. Oh my, God. such a complete picture. <laughs> what were your favorite movies as kids? Do you have any uh, like ones that you just were obsessed with? Oh. Uh, well, I love Ghostbusters in the theater from underneath the seat. I was so terrified. So uh, nice. mm -hmm. Well, see, that's another thing of Santa Cruz, and we all we were all were there for the opening of Jaws. <gasps> and, uh, <gasps> that screwed us up because then when we got in the water the next time, we were all messed up. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's really why you stopped being a lifeguard in a beach bomb, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's where you're from, Johnny, right? Didn't you grow up where Jaws was shot? I did spend my summers on Martha's Vineyard. And mm -hmm. um, my uh, acting teacher was, oh God, I can't remember her character name, but she was the one who slapped Brody because Miss, her son Miss died. Miss Kittner, <laughs> right? Miss Kittner. And, really and my pediatrician was the coroner. I mean, it was crazy. They did cast a lot of people on island for these roles. I would love to do a director's commentary of you watching Jaws, just being like, that's my pediatrician. <laughs> that's a great idea for a movie, like that little town that they come to to make the big budget movie and all the people, the pediatrician plays the coroner. <laughs> mm. That's a fun idea. I love that. Okay, this I'm excited to hear. What were your first audition monologue, songs, whatever. You remember like going into your first ones and you, it's gotta be something amazing. <laughs> what were they, please share. I'll go first. <laughs> I remember, I, I don't know how I, I, I auditioned for a street bum who was playing the violin and it was for a commercial. And I had, and 
lo and behold, we were supposed to have brought violins. And I, there was a, a, a girl who was going in after me, like girl, like she was little. And I said, can I borrow your violin? And I went in and I went, dee, nee, nee, nee. and I, I, they were all laughing because I was humming a tune while I pretended to play on the violin. <laughs> and it was the most embarrassing thing of my life. Um, and then I handed it back to her afterwards after having fallen down and laughing at myself. Um, uh, so that was, that was very early on in the career. That's amazing. Did um, you get the job? No, no. no. <laughs> Did the little girl get the, get to be the street? I think so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, my my go to monologue was um, Lizzie in the Rainmaker because farmer. Sure. And uh, and I oh, my song my sixteen bars were um, Mr. Snow. Oh. 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 I feel like even your pieces take place on farms. <laughs> Well, um, you know, Rainmaker was, I did an ACT program when I was a freshman in high school and I was, oh no, sorry, that was wrong. That was Star Spangled Girl. Oh. Oh no, 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 okay. Never mind. Okay, go on. Question. Almost, Almost another connection. I love Almost your ACT computer. <laughs> okay, do you have anything that always goes with you in your dressing rooms? Any standby dressing room items? Mm. I have a little laughing yogi um, from Thailand that I got. Um, uh, and so that's, I rub his head before I go out. I love that. Mm. It gives me a twinkle in my eye before I go out. I actually have a little bit of a problem with breaking up um, when it's a serious play and getting a twinkle in my eye because, and people are like, I, I can see my fellow actors are going, what is he doing? Um, <laughs> And it's because I think it's because of the little yogi. <laughs> it's mm. mischievous. We have a laughing yogi in our office as well. Uh, he's you he's the general manager, Reed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's hope he's watching. Oh, please. <laughs> That's amazing. I don't know if I have things. I'm trying to think if there's anything that comes with me every single time. I don't think so anymore. That's sort of sad. I kind of want to start a ritual. Maybe I'll get to have enough dressing rooms yet where I can have a new ritual. But I always do buy, like if I have a new dress, I go out and I buy a pretty dish towel. Okay. And then like a pretty mug. Oh. Hmm. Have it, you know, it's like a, sort of a clean slate. So I guess, hmm. but it's not. I didn't have like an object that comes along. I mean, unless you count like scotch. Sure. <laughs> for those who don't know, I don't even really know why this is a thing, but for those listening, most stations, everyone puts down a little towel and all their sort of like makeup things are on it. I don't know why the, the towel has become the official demarcation of the station, but it has. No, but it is, if you're with a lot of people too, you know, it's kind of says like, this is mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Move away. <clears throat> but it also keeps, you know, hygiene. Yeah. Um, okay. I think we have a final question here. Oops, I just had it. Best advice you've ever been given? Oh. Good advice. It can be industry <sighs> advice. It can be life advice. Any sort of anything coming to mind. Oh, my God. It flashed into my head so clearly. <gasps> And I remember, and it's weird, I don't think my mom told me, um, I was on like a college team, and uh, she said, the job that you are going to have has not been invented yet. And I think there's something about that, like for now, right now, it means to me that like, I don't have to just be an actor. I don't have to just be a playwright. I don't have to just be a, you know, I can be, a sort of hyphenate of my own imagining, but, um, and it sort of also, I think, gives me permission to continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. That's mm -hmm. great advice. Yeah, that's really great advice. It's funny, I, I, Jess has been recently giving advice. The only advice to give to new parents is that everything is a phase, which isn't even advice, it's just 
like stating the facts and that's a <laughs> life thing, but it's also um, that whatever it takes for to work for you, for your family, but I always expound that for everybody, whatever it takes to make it work for you is all that matters. And then you try to have that meld with other people that you come in contact with. But if that's what it takes in this lifetime to do, then you have to lean into that and not doubt what your natural path is going to be. And it's something, it's, it's sort of hooking in with yours, Heidi. So there's something there, right? But those are, the, yeah, those are things that Jess has been saying recently that I've been interested in. Oh man, you guys, this is insane. This is insane. Yeah. Um, so beautiful. Um, honestly, a lot of the things you guys said tonight spoke spoke to spoke to me personally, but I'm sure it spoke to all of us and certainly all of those listening in. Um, I don't know. There's just, those are some wise words during this crazy time we're we're, we're hopefully coming out of, but still. Mm-hmm. Amen. Well, I knew tonight was going to be a special night and you did not disappoint. It was an <laughs> absolute joy to have you um, with us tonight. And I can't wait until the day uh, I'm able to hug you in person and the day when you are back on the Keen Company stage in show number four. Mm -hmm. And may it be soon. For, for show yes. number four, yeah. With the yeah, caps. Yeah. <laughs> with the cats, with yeah. the cats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for including us in your season of interviews and uh, after hours. And it's just, it's a gift. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was really nice to see you all and be here with you. Well, thank you. And you are, are officially our last after hours guests. Um, so uh, couldn't think of a, a better way to sort of end this season with the two of you, mm -hmm. such amazing people with generous hearts. Thank you. Here's to next season. Yes. yes. Here's next. Exactly. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Bye, guys. Bye. Sending you love. Oh, oh man. Another great great after hours. I know another I say that every time, but I'm just really <laughs> thrilled every Monday to be Absolutely. sitting down with you people and chatting. And mm. they always surprise me. I don't know. Like the conversation always goes in a way that I, I didn't expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Such uh, fantastic perspectives from both of them. Now, we didn't Beautiful. get as much Johnny Silverstein dirt as I would have liked to unearth, wow. but we're going to have to bring them back. Yeah. And we'll, do, we'll do another, an after, after, after hours. Yep. On the 17th. Maybe, yeah. maybe, or maybe that's what we should do next year is bring everyone back, have it like at like 10 at night mm -hmm. and with drinks in hand. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we just play their previous episode and just dish on yeah, yeah. it. Exactly. Right. With them. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. So we're going to be gone for five weeks during after hours. Mm -hmm. However, we've got a bunch of things coming up over the next. I mean, we, we don't we don't stop. This is not stopping. Mm -mm. Um, so first of all, uh, we've got a new audio play coming yes. out in, I believe, three weeks. Yes. Three weeks. It's called Radio Nowhere. It is by Kate Cortese. Mm -hmm. uh, it is directed by Taylor Reynolds. And <clears throat> one of the cast members happens to be someone who is in one of our first After Hours, Mr. George Salazar. That's right. He was the first After Hours. Yeah. Whoa, I think he was. It was oh my God. Pig. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that is going to be coming out in three weeks. Mm -hmm. And then around that time, uh, we have a little certain special holiday coming up on April 21st. Mm -hmm. It is called hashtag give 21 on 21. Everyone's Ashley, favorite Keen Telethon is back. Ashley, can you tell us a little bit more about Give 21 on 21? Sure. So uh, our Give 21 on 21 will be a special day of keen giving where donors will be asked to give us $21 in honor of our 21st season on April 21. Because if you watched all these episodes and didn't know that we love puns, then we're, we're going all in. Um, hashtag Give 21 on 21. 
Um, it's just, it's a, gonna be an online sort of telethon, a, a viral campaign to raise money, not just to support um, this season, but to really set us up and strengthen us for next season. So if you loved all the virtual programming we did this season, thank you so much. Um, and if you're excited to see Keen back in the theater, then um, definitely mark your calendars for April 21st. Now, we'll accept donations anytime, <laughs> but the April 21st is gonna be a special, exciting, fun day. There's gonna be a lot of talk about our donor thermometer, which is yes. one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, um, and then, you know, we will be back for a special Keen After Hours with Team Keen on uh, May 17th with a lot of fun things happening after that as well. There's a lot coming up, but as a reminder, there's a, we've had a full season. So at any time you can go back to our website, watch mm -hmm. all the past After Hours. They're also available on Facebook or or. YouTube, wherever you're watching this right now, you can find the old episodes. Uh, you can also watch or listen to any of our radio plays from the Here Now Season of Audio Theater on any podcast app or on our website. A bunch of awesome um, plays written specifically for the audio format. So if you are, you know, having a lazy week, if you need some new jams, if you want some friendly, keen voices hanging out in the background, then give us a listen or a watch and uh, let us know what you think. Awesome. Well, um, it was again a pleasure to be with you both tonight. Um, and it was a pleasure to be with you all at home. So thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to seeing you at the virtual theater soon. Thank you so much. Good night. <laughs>